I normally talk pretty loud. Can everybody hear me? So I won't use the microphone because it's annoying to carry around. So I'm going to talk a little bit about CQRS and event sourcing today. But before we get into that, I want to let you guys know a little bit about where it came from. The first time I did this talk was probably in 2007 or 2008. So we were working on a really unusual system. We were processing 10,000 transactions per second. How many of you do that? Okay, so you would think that very often this is not necessarily going to be applicable to the things that you're looking at doing. I was really sorry, but I think you can use the mic because you have to record it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I was saying... <laughs> because frankly, there are about a dozen of them on the planet. What gets really interesting is when we start talking about the lessons that we learned there and how those lessons may actually apply to other systems. In particular, things that we found that actually had real business value when we applied them on other projects. So to start off with, I'll just go through our agenda. The first thing we're going to talk about is some of the problems that we have. And then we're going to start going through each of the breakthroughs that we ended up coming across that led us to being able to build a system like that. And it was a really, really odd choice to use domain-driven design on a project that does 10,000 transactions per second, no? Most people would run right towards C. <laughs> the first breakthrough we're going to talk about is explicit state representation. Or said simply, using events. The next one that we're going to talk about is using events as a form of storage, which sounds really odd. But as we get into it, we'll see if this is not a new idea. It's only been around for about a 1,000 years. We're then going to talk about command and query separation. Now, since then, that has actually become no longer command and query separation. We called it command and query separation when we started because that's what we thought we were doing. Since then, we called it command and query responsibility segregation, or CQRS, because the full name is really long. It doesn't come off the tongue that well. Someone's actually telling me that we should call it seekers. The last thing we're going to talk about is asynchronous context mapping. After that, we're going to go through, we're going to summarize up some of the points that we've gone through throughout the day. And then we're going to go through, we're going to give maybe about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. If your question doesn't get in, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'll be around the rest of the day. I'm happy to answer questions. And, and I'm curious, because I've never given a talk in the Ukraine before. Are you guys like Norwegians? Norwegians do not ask questions. <laughs> the more of them you get into a room, the less questions you will get. So hopefully we'll get a few questions at least from people. Now, to start off with, when we were building this type of system, one thing that we needed was a safety net. You would be amazed at how fast an algorithm can lose money. We need to have some sort of safety net for when we actually push stuff out. Let's say that you're losing a penny and a half per share doing 500 trades per second. How long do you think it takes you to blow through a month's worth of profits? Not very long. <laughs> I can tell you it happens. The next thing that we really wanted was we wanted to have some kind of scientific rigor associated with our system. We did not want our system to basically just be a system where we you know, kind of stuck our thumb up our butts and told you it's going to rain on Thursday. We wanted things to be deterministic. We wanted to be able to actually go back and do things again. We wanted to see how things would have existed two weeks ago if we looked at them in a slightly different way. The reasoning behind this is because that had a lot of business value for us. It wasn't something technical. 
And the last thing that we really needed was a real audit trail. Now I'm curious, how many of you have audits in your system of some kind? Could be file, it could be a database table. Now, I want you to keep your hand up if you can prove it's correct. <laughs> so if you can't prove your audit log is correct, what's the point of having an audit log? This is our best guess as to what the state of the system was yesterday at 11 a.m. We don't actually know, but this is our guess. And we're going to make decisions off of this. There's another group that had a similar issue to this. Hansel and Gretel had audit log. They were leaving little breadcrumbs as they walked through the forest. Unfortunately, the animals came behind and ate their breadcrumbs. Now, my argument for you would be, if you don't know your audit log is correct, you might have been better off not having an audit log. They would have been better off if they had not left an audit log. Then they would have had bread, they wouldn't have been hungry, and they wouldn't have ended up in the house. The major breakthrough that we had here was that in order to get an audit log, we have to represent state explicitly. Anything that changes inside of our model is a domain concept. This is a big difference compared to the way that we normally work. Now, if you guys are using your domain model, let's say Entity Framework or Hibernate, who here is a Java developer? Very few hands. .NET? <laughs> Haskell? <laughs> Scala? So let's say that we're using Entity Framework. If you go through and change a domain object and tell and hibernate to save, will it save whatever you did? Yeah. So, what changes is an implicit concept. It is implicit in that it is whatever and hibernate or ND framework that it's going to be is what it is. Now, that may change over time. You may have bugs in your code. Every time you change an address, you may accidentally change the phone number, the 1111111. And hibernate or ND framework is still going to find it. The problem that we run into here is that it's an implicit concept. If we want to be able to do a lot of the kinds of things we we're talking about with audit logs, the first thing that we need to do is we need to make every state transition inside of the domain an explicit concept. And we hear about explicit concepts all the time in domain-driven design. One of the main goals of domain-driven design, you might have heard this sentence before, is to make the implicit explicit. This also comes back to our language. Because if I make an explicit thing that represents my change, that means I've defined what that means. It's not that I change, uh, or let's say move a customer's location, and afterwards that means what Hibernate says it does. It means that when I move a customer's location, I get a customer's location moved. Now when we look at the language there, this concept of an event is always going to be a verb in the past tense. And there's a reason for that. Because it's an action that has completed, it's finished. You are not allowed to say, no, this never happened. The reason why is that parallel realities are too difficult to go through and model in most business systems. That said, if you're working for CERN and they've actually found something faster than the speed of light, it might be important for you. However, your business experts probably only deal with a single reality at a time. Now, this going through and making this concept explicit is going to enter this concept into our language. When we talk about things, 
we will now have a word that represents this action that completed in the past. We will have one of these for every use case in our system. I know that sounds like a lot of typing. Trust me on this one, if typing is the biggest bottleneck in modeling your domain, you're probably doing something wrong. Normally it's that thinking part that gets in the way first. So, once we've gone through and modeled state changes explicitly, we get some really interesting possibilities that start creeping up. The biggest one is we're going to be able to use those things that have happened in the past in how we store our data. And there's lots of advantages that can be re realized by storing data in that way as opposed to in a database. One interesting thing is when we look at more mature domain models, when I say a mature domain model, I mean something that I can go learn in university. Finance, accounting, insurance. How do we calculate out the price for a piece of insurance? These are mature domain models. They have been formalized over hundreds of years. Oddly, they will have no concept of current state inside of them. Instead, everything is represented as a series of things that have been done by the system previously. And there's lots of reasons why you may prefer to do that that we're going to go through. But to start off with, this would be a typical way of storing state inside the system. Does anybody have something that looks kind of like this? Maybe you've got some object with children objects. Maybe you've got a purchase order. It's got N line items and some shipping information on it. This is not the only way of representing an object like this. There are other ways that we can represent this same exact object. Another way that we can do it is as a series of behaviors that have happened previously. I can have that the cart was created. Three items were added to the cart and shipping information was added to the cart. At any given point in time, I can create this from that. I can always redo what's happened in the past and get back to whatever I currently view this thing as meaning. That's one of the biggest benefits of this style of working. So I'm going to repeat it. I can at any given point in time go from this to whatever my current viewpoint of that is. The trick here is my current viewpoint of this can change. I may look at it in different ways in the future. How many people here have refactored their domain model before? Okay, so you guys built some SQL scripts to go update your SQL database, and you roll out to production, and it runs for, I don't know, eight hours, and then it fails miserably. <laughs> now what? How do you undo that? One of the main benefits of storing things like this is that they are versioned separately from our model itself. My schema will never change. My schema, we can imagine, it's a blob. If I create a new kind of event, can I put a new kind of event inside of a blob? I would hope so. Unless I somehow came up with a new event that doesn't actually fit in the blobs. I don't know how I would do that. But before we go into a lot of the other, prop, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other good things about this, we have to go into one thing first. Now that first slide I showed you, where we had the picture of the account, when we were talking about how accounting and finance work this way, that took me forever to find. The reason it took me forever to find is because it's an accountant erasing something in the middle of their ledger. This does not happen. Account 
accountants never erase something in the middle of their ledger. If they do, they go to jail. In fact, in most accounting courses, they teach you if you're using a pencil, you're doing something wrong. So what will end up happening with an accountant? Let's say that he fat fingers a key. And instead of transferring me $10,000, he transfers me $100,000. Lucky me. Does he just go back and delete a zero? No. What he will do is he will go back and he will remove the 100,000 from me. And then he will re-add the 10,000. This is the same thing that we want to do and how our systems work. This is known as a full compensation. Undo the entire mistake and then redo what you really wanted to do. There's another kind of compensation as well. It's called partial compensation. Now, partial compensation would basically be that he would remove 90000 from my account. Accountants prefer to not do this. They prefer to not do that particular operation because it requires thought now to figure out what actually went wrong. It's better to go and undo everything that has been done previously in error and then redo it correctly. We can do the exact same thing inside of our systems. So now I've got my cart being created, three items being added, and note that is three events. I, I made it just say three because if I had put all three there, the boxes got really little on the screen. Then we have one item being removed, and then we have shipping information being added. Is this the same as if I were only to add two items. I hear some yeses and some noes. The final result is the same. The final result is the same. Well, the final result is the same if I want to look at them like this. What if I wanted to make this, but instead all it's going to track is line items and how many times they were removed? Would it still be the same? Not at all. One of the major benefits of this way of doing things is because we're storing all of the behaviors, we're not losing any information. <coughs> How many people in here have an update or a delete in their current system? Okay, so my question for you would be, how did you determine the value of the information that you were losing? How many of you feel that you can predict what your business is going to ask you in five years? How about five months? Five days? <laughs> Sometimes I really question about five minutes. So if we cannot figure out what they're going to want or value in five weeks, how is it that we decide which data is not important and it's okay to lose? Would this be the thumb up our butt say it's going to rain next Thursday metric? It works pretty well in Vancouver. The thing is, more often than not, we don't even think about these questions. And instead, we end up in a different situation. Now it's best to go through an example of this. So let's imagine we're using this structural model here. And our business expert comes to us and says, I've got this really crazy idea. I think that if we look back at orders that were being placed with us, if we look at items that were removed within one minute and 12 seconds of them checking out, they are more likely to buy that item than they are the other items that we show them based upon other things. Now, if we go through, I'm just a bit confused because this should be the 10 minute thing. I'm nowhere near that point. <laughs> if we go through and look back, 
at our history, we don't have that information. We never stored what items are being removed. So now we're going to come through and we're going to add a new thing here. The new thing we're going to add is remove the line items. We're a good Agile team. We're doing it in this iteration. We build out a report. The report basically says that now we've got all these removed items. But what data will we see on that report? We install the update, and he brings up the report. Well, we just started tracking items that were removed, so we'll have no data. OK, let's try it with this. So he comes to us with the same requirement, and we go through and we write some new event handlers. A projection is what we call them, a grouping of event handlers. One of them is going to look for items being removed. Another one is going to look for shipping information being added during our checkout period. And then we're going to have another one that looks for items being added back by the same person later on. Now, when we go to release this to production, we don't just release it. What we do is we go through and rerun it across our entire log from the beginning of time. What does our domain expert see when he pulls up his report? He sees the report as if it's always been in the system. He sees information from last year on the report. He can run trending analysis to see if this has actually changed over time. He can see back in time as if this projection of the system were always there. The reason we can do this is because we don't lose information. It's important when we look at systems that we recognize losing information is a really bad idea because we have no idea how to value information. We don't know what this information will be worth two weeks from now. When we talk about using domain-driven design, we don't use domain-driven design everywhere. We use domain-driven design in areas where our organization derives its competitive advantage. Now, in an area where we derive our competitive advantage, what might it be worth to not say no? To say we did not lose that information, we still have it. It's something that can feasibly make or break our company. It could be that this will actually push us over the edge of our competitors. Or if we can't do it, we may lose. The value of this information is huge. Now generally when we go through, we look at a lot of this stuff in terms of risk management. We look at cost versus possible benefit. Now how much would it cost me to get five terabytes of storage space? Thousand euro? How many events do you think I can fit in five terabytes of disk? To give you an idea, for every transaction happening in financial markets in North America, small data set, you would be able to hold about half a year's worth of information. Now, I only have one rule as CTO. We will not lose data. Anything that comes into our walls, we will keep. Because I have no idea how much it's going to be worth later. This is something that we really need to focus on. We make these decisions on a regular basis where we lose information from the business. Yet, how many of you have actually talked with a domain expert about what the value of the data that was updated was. But yet, almost everybody had updates and deletes in their system. The main thing about storing information in this way is that we're not losing anything. 
I can go back in time and look at things in new and interesting ways. And because I'm actually storing all of the behaviors that my system did, I can guarantee you that we will be able to give you any possible structure model like this. No matter what ridiculous model they want me to build out, I know I can build it because I'm not losing any information. Now, there's lots of other things that come along with this. So I'm going to jump into one really quick that's a little bit of programmer pornography. <laughs> this is not why you should be using this stuff. But how hard are append-only models to scale? There's no locks. They scale very easily. So if you need to scale, this is a model that can scale extremely well. Because you're not coming back to try to lock on data to update it. You're not getting conflicts. Locks are the enemies of distributed systems. But beyond that, there's some other really cool things we can do once we actually have an entire event stream. Now, I know you guys are all perfect. That's why I'm hiring my development team out here. But how many of you guys have written code with bug in it? Now, it's always the most fun when you get a user calling you about the problem. And the conversation goes something like this. Yeah, the system's a piece of crap. <laughs> it wouldn't let me do this, this, and this. However, I was the hero and I managed to fix it and now it works. And you're thinking, crap, how do I reproduce this? There are loads of situations that we run into like this. If I have an event log, I have the ability to look at the system as it was at any point in time. I can see the commands that he was sending in, and we'll talk about what commands are in a few minutes. But I can see him telling the system to do something, and I can see he got an error and what error he got. So what I do is I bring the system up as it was at the time when he was issuing that command. Except I do it in my debugger. And then I step through the processing of his command. And I see things as they were happening back when he was doing this. It also makes quite a nice unit test to start off with. This ability to go back in time can help us in other scenarios as well. Has anybody here ever built a temporal data model? Aren't they fun? <laughs> if you have not built one, you really need to go read up Fowler's writing on building temporal data models. They are not the most fun thing on Earth to be building. <laughs> They get to be extremely complex, especially for querying. But what if I wanted to build up a temporal data model with my event stream? I want to bring up an aggregate as it existed on August 11th, 2007 at 12.04 p.m. I just only play the events up to that point. And then I'm given the object as it existed at that point in time. There are some other cool things that we can do if we have things modeled as events. I mentioned earlier, one of the things we were really worried about was unintended consequences. We made a change to code, and we broke something. It happens. So every week, what we did was we would actually rerun every command the system had ever processed. And we had a program that would diff the output. So if behaviors had changed, maybe the output's different. We would run it every single week and look at the diff and looked at what changed. Is it things that we expected to change or is it things that we did not expect to see changed? 
given, this will not get rid of all unintended consequences. However, this will get rid of a huge number of your unintended consequences. You're rerunning every transaction the system has done previously. You still run black swan problems, some event that you've never seen in the past, but for the most part, you're generally going to be okay. You're gonna catch a huge number of these problems while you're still in development and not in production. Okay. Not a surprise, I think you guys might actually be Norwegian because I usually have somebody yell out a question. But what happens when you have two million events? So now in order to build up my object, I've got two million events that have happened in the past. That would be rather difficult to build out, wouldn't it? Oddly, we had some of those. Microsoft and Google train a lot. So we don't always load everything from the beginning to the end. We have a heuristic that lets us get around this problem. But before I go into the heuristic, I want to be very clear that conceptually, we always consider the problem like this. We always consider that we go from the beginning of time to the end of time. Now, sometimes, we're going to end up in a situation where we've got two million previous events, and well, it would take us an hour and a half to load up that particular object. Probably our users left the screen by that point. So instead, what we do is we have a pattern called rolling snapshots. And instead of walking from the beginning of time to the end of the time, we page backwards. So we start at the end of time and go to the beginning of time. We get number six. Are you a snapshot? No. Put you on a stack. Number five, are you a snapshot? No, put you on a stack. The next thing we're going to get is actually a snapshot. When we get the snapshot, we pull it off, and then we start popping off the stack and replaying the events until the stack is empty. <coughs> now, a snapshot is not some big fancy thing. It can be done as simply as serializing your object. That's generally how it's implemented. However, when you go through and serialize your object, it's not necessarily a good idea to serialize it using, let's say, a binary serializer. You guys have probably experienced this kind of pain before. It's the same one as when you release a new version of your software with a refactor in it. Now we have to worry about versioning all of our snapshots. Instead, what we will generally do is we will go through and we will use what's known as the memento pattern. How many people here know the memento pattern from Gang of Four? All the Java guys have their hands up. <laughs> I think it's actually a prerequisite to Java to actually memorize the book, line for line, and to learn that XML is a true and complete language. <laughs> In .NET, it's called a serialization surrogate. It's one of those weird, obscure things inside of the serializer interfaces that they give you. It basically allows me to specify that when I get serialized, I want to return a different object that should be serialized instead of me. What that allows me to do is it allows me to version separately me versus my serialization format. Again, this is not a very difficult pattern. However, you should be very careful where you use this. I see people using this when they've got three events. You don't want a snapshot if you only have three events. You're better off leaving it in the conceptual model of this. Hell, even up to about a thousand events, you're still probably going to be better off here than trying to drop in snapshots. Snapshots are heuristic, but they add a level of complexity. A lot of the frameworks today push you to put snapshots on everything, which to me is insane. If you use snapshots, you will have to deal with versioning of the snapshots because you're versioning your own structural model for the snapshot. If your structural model changes, you are going to have to go back and deal with versioning when you want to release the production. Just like today, if you want to release the production and you change your database schema, it's not necessarily a very fun time. Now, how many people here have been
been to the doctor before. <laughs> and most of the hands aren't up. Is it really that bad? <laughs> now when you go to the doctor and you walk in, does he take a picture of you? Open up your folder, throw in the old picture of you and put the new picture in? I, I hope not. Be kind of creepy. The real question is if he asks you to take off your clothes first. <laughs> we can do the same kind of thing. How many people here have heard of a document database before? Maybe RavenDB? I hear somebody talk about that later. <laughs> We could use something like RavenDB as an event storage. What if my folder were my document? And I just write new events to the end of it. It'd be a relatively easy thing to do. And it'd be just conceptually like what happens with the doctor. Every time you go to the doctor, he does some treatment for you. He writes down whatever that treatment was on a piece of paper, appends it, to your folder. Now I saw my grandmother's before she passed away. Hers must have been about that thick. Mine writes much thinner. But we can look at using events as a conceptual model with a lot of these document databases or key value stores. You can very easily, and I can tell you it would actually take less than a couple days, implement an event store over HBase. I hear HBase is slightly scalable. Unless, of course, you need to be bigger than Google. There's lots of different things we can look at with this. Now, if you do want to use a document database approach, and you have to worry about snapshotting, there is one special thing you will need your document database to be able to do. You will need it to be able to page or pull information out stream in reverse. That sounds a bit bizarre, doesn't it? <coughs> Most of them only support streaming in a document in a forward direction, not in a backwards. But it's a fairly easy operation that can be added to a lot of them as well. I know people have already done it for MongoDB and a couple of the other ones. Well, moving on. Again, I'm surprised that I haven't had someone blurt out the question. If all I store are events of the behaviors my system did, could I issue a query for, I would like to see all the active orders? I guess if I were to put it into like my events in XML and some sort of weird XML field in the SQL server and then try to do some magic in my query to order them and then process them in a query, but that'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? So the general idea here is if you want to use that method that I showed you, it's kind of unfortunate that you will only be allowed to issue one query. The one query that you can issue is get aggregate by ID. How many of you are doing something with a domain model right now? How many of you have a domain model that's only getters and centers inside of it? We'll talk about that one in a few minutes. The big problem people run into and why they are unable to implement this completely event-centric way of doing things is that they're unable to query. They're unable to go through and query their data. And I'm getting really confused with the timings here because I keep getting shown signs at different times and they don't match up with what I know it's supposed to be. When we're going through and querying data, we can't do it if all we store are events. Events are beautiful as a transactional model but they suck as a querying model. It's awful to try to query off of events. So, why don't we not do that? This is where, partially, C 
CDRS comes from. So before we get into CQRS, I'm going to go through what I call my stereotypical architecture. And, and just to be sure, that five minute notice was incorrect, right? Okay, just checking. Because I could have sworn I had more time than that. So at the very top here, we're going to have a data storage. And then we're going to have a bunch of domain objects on top of the data storage. On top of that, we're going to have application services. You may use command handlers. They're the same thing. It's just a simple refactor. Then we're going to have a remote facade. Now, you don't have to have a remote facade. I just drew it that way. It could just be a layer boundary, not a tier boundary. On the bottom, we've got client. This client is requesting DTOs. He might say, give me customer 1234. Now that's going to come down to the client, and then the client's going to edit this data somehow. We all like editing data, right? And then we're going to send back up our customer. It's going to go to the remote facade. The application service is going to map it to the domain layer, and then it's going to get saved back down to the data storage. A key point here is that the same DTO tends to be sent here and there. It's a customer on both sides. I'm curious, does anybody have an architecture kind of like this? We've seen this in guidance for years and years and years. I think Microsoft has built at least 20 frameworks to help you build this. Now, what was really odd for me was I was a while ago at the Paris, all, or sorry, the Paris DDD group. And I asked them how many of them were actually using this architecture, and pretty much all of them raised their hands. The funniest thing about this architecture is it's absolutely impossible to do DDD with it. The reason it's impossible is because we lose the intent of the operation. When I send up a customer with activated equals false, I have lost the intent of what the user wanted to do. My domain model has now become an abstraction over my database, nothing more. The reason it's impossible to do DDD with this model is that you are going to have precisely four verbs that your domain experts are allowed to use. Create, read, update and delete. But it's actually going to be even worse than that. Because as we talked about earlier, you don't want updates and deletes. So they can only actually use the word create. And they will run around and say create on everything. How many of you have domain experts that are like that? Maybe they use the word change, update, remove. It's funny, I was actually working with a team out in Lithuania on a conference call a couple weeks ago. And they had a big problem they were running into because they wanted to be able to remove things. And one of the things that they were asking is, you know, well, what happens when we delete an employee? And I don't know where on earth they're thinking they're going to be deleting people. <laughs> oh, you wanted to terminate their employment. That's very different than deleting somebody. We need to remember this when we're going through with people. Believe it or not, we have actually done ourselves a very large disservice. We've done ourselves a disservice because, yes? <laughs>
Well, I guess I'll go a little bit faster then, but I could have sworn, like, when I looked at the schedule, right when I came on, I had an hour and ten. That's what I planned on. Okay, so, very quickly with this architecture. We have lots of problems with it. Has anybody ever tried scaling this architecture? Now I'm curious. If you've tried scaling this before, did you find it odd the same people who give you all of the guidance on how to do this, all of the tools to help you do it, are the same people that control your scaling story? They're database vendors. <laughs> Oddly, it doesn't scale very well. Now, the real core problem that we have here is in this process where we send a DTO back and forth between the server. Instead, what we're going to want to do is we're going to introduce a new concept called command. So the client should tell the server to do something. I know that sounds bizarre. But if it tells me to do something, then I can actually model the logic around what that thing means. I can actually have business logic. If we do not have business logic in our domain model, like if we come back here and say that there is no capability of having business logic up there, where does that mean the business logic lives? Everyone always says the client, but I don't believe you guys. See, developers know it's really bad to put business logic in clients. So what they do is they put the business logic in their users' heads. <laughs> or they ship it with their software, with this thing called a manual. And I've actually had somebody argue with me saying doing that is better. The reason why doing it is better with doing it that way is because, well, if you need to change stuff, you only need to release new pieces of paper. The problem is when we go back, we try to report off this information. Because very often when we have them going to nine screens to do a task, they will never actually go through and do it correctly. They skip a step. They skip two steps. We've also lost why they were changing that information. So, moving ahead. I know, that jumped way forward. What we're going to do is we are going to apply CQRS to that original architecture. And this is just the first level of CQRS here. So we're going to follow CQS first. CQS basically states, and it's from Bertrand Meyer, who has one of the best books on object orientation you'll ever read, that we need to split apart the concepts of commands from the concepts of queries. Queries return data. They're not allowed to mutate state. Commands are allowed to mutate state, but they don't return anything. They're void or unit return types. The distinction is quite important between those two. Going past that, we're going to do one more thing. We're going to say that we're going to pull apart all of the commands and put them onto one service, and all of the queries and put them onto the other service. We're going to have two services. And there's a lot of reasons we're going to do that, but the biggest one is that commands and queries are extremely different. The largest thing that we run into is that our querying model is different than our command model. Processing transactions has nothing to do with information that you show on people's screens. Processing transactions is about managing invariance. It's about managing consistency boundaries. Does that have anything at all to do with what you show on the screen? I tend to look at systems as being reports that I can generate commands from. The two are completely disconnected. If we take
take that point of view, we run into something. If we were to try to use the exact same model for both, it's going to be more complex than making a single model for each of them. So what we're going to do here is we're going to allow ourselves to have two different kinds of models. One on the read side, one on the right side. All of you people using ORMs, who here enjoys optimizing queries? <laughs> well, it takes a lot of knowledge to optimize a query. We need to know the domain model, we need to know the data model, and we need to know how the ORM is going to do that magic to convert it. So one of the first specializations that we make is we say we're going to go directly back to the data model here. Imagine Leap to SQL projecting on a DTO. It's actually simpler than trying to do it off of our domain model. And it will get rid of the need for getters and setters. Now when we talk about queries, queries are very different than commands. They have a different perspective on the data that they're looking at. They are screen oriented. We mentioned this before, but there's a reason we do it. You don't want to have to make 27 requests in order to build your screen. The user will perceive it as being faster if it's only one. So DTOs tend to map back towards screens. It's a very common pattern. This has nothing to do with our domain model. Our UI and our domain model can look completely different. This is why a lot of people have problems with a lot of these tools that will generate UIs off of your domain model. Because they shouldn't look anything like each other. Do you really believe the domain expert at McDonald's thinks in pictures? If you go to the McDonald's terminal, they don't even have words, they just have pictures. Something tells me he at least thinks in words. The UI has nothing to do with the domain model. Another big difference. Most systems I deal with, and I imagine you guys will probably fit in this, have one to two orders of magnitude more reads than writes. So somebody will read data 100 times for every one time that they write it. Okay, so why are we focused on scaling our rights? It becomes what? Rights can be more expensive, but I find if you deal with them correctly, they can actually be cheaper. Reads on most databases are actually more expensive than rights. When I'm going back and writing, I'm writing and updating one table. I'm updating three columns on it. When I do a read, I'm doing 14 joins. Which one of those is a more expensive operation? The thing is, when we talk about scaling, we normally need to scale reads, not writes. And we can scale our reads because most queries can operate with relaxed consistency anyway. How many of you use pessimistic locking? If you're not using pessimistic locking, you can probably use eventual consistency on your reads. Because if I send you information and somebody changes it while it's on the network, I don't have a yo-yo packet. It doesn't come back to me and get updated. So it's already eventually consistent. Let's just talk about how long that period of time can be. Normally, the longest period of time is actually the user, not the network. Users are seconds to minutes of eventual consistency before they come back with information. Networks are generally milliseconds. We could very easily make our system have eventually consistent reads. Make it go over to the data storage through events. Now, if I wanted to, I can make as many of those data storages as I want. All I have to do is multiplex a queue. Multiplexing a queue is a solved problem. It's been solved for 40 or 50 years. I can hit as close to linear scalability as you're going to get with that. 5,000 
request per second? No problem. And it's a relatively simple model to build out. The reason we can do this is because we've made a different decision on the read side. We made a different decision in terms of cap theorem. Consistency, availability, partitionability, choose any two to guarantee at the same time. On that side, we showed consistency and availability. On this side, we're going to choose availability and partitionability. Because only 1% of our transactions are right. Hell, I've worked at some places where only 0.01% were right. And very often, it's OK if it takes one second for data to show up. It's acceptable from a business risk perspective. Now, more importantly than the ability to scale out reads, we've changed how the domain works internally. We can get rid of all of our getters and setters. We can get rid of our getters and setters because we don't project DTOs off of things anymore. You guys already have behaviors, I hope. Yes? So the setters are not that great. But we can get rid of all of our getters as well. This is actually a quick little slide that I had grabbed. It was actually someone else doing a talk at QCon. I won't say who they were. And I ran to them right before my talk, and I said, can I get an image of that? So that's all the getters and setters. The rest of it, those four things in the middle there, that's actual behavior. Who wants to write some unit tests across this interface for me? <laughs> When we apply getters and setters, we are not doing object-oriented code most of the time. Most of the time, they're evil. Now, I'm not going to say they're anti-pattern, but I will say they are a definite smell. If you see them in a domain model, it means you're probably doing something wrong if you thought you were building a domain model. You're probably in a data model. Now, I'm just going to skip through that and go right to the summary, since Apparently, time has changed. Now, when we talk about dealing with different bounded contexts, it's important that we remember that they can normally also act with relaxed consistency. And it's always going to be better from a technology perspective if we tell them that we did something as opposed to them asking us for information. That said, you cannot always do that. The time that you cannot do it would be, let's say, I'm building Google Earth. OK, I'm going to tell you all the updates to Google Earth to your cell phone. And you'll run Google Earth locally. How many of you carry around 50,000 servers as your cell phone? <laughs> it's not going to work very well. However, our default should be to be following tell, don't, ask even on integration level between contexts. I should be telling you what happened in my context. You should not be asking me questions most of the time. Now, to go through the summary, we need to remember that state transitions are important concepts. They are things that have occurred. They deserve to be part of our language. I'm not going to call them anti-patterns, but we need to remember that getters and setters smell. When we, when we see them, we should be thinking that there's probably something wrong. Not always, but probably. Especially if we thought we were building out a model. We need to remember that we should be following tell, don't ask at higher levels, including integration with other systems. And the most important thing that I want everybody in this room to actually get is that more often than not, if we build out one single model that has multiple usages, multiple ways of being used, it's generally going to be more complex than if we build out specialized models for handling each individual problem that the thing was doing. It's oftentimes cheaper 
to build out a model that's specialized on reading and another one specialized on writing than to try to find the model that's going to work for both. And there's a reason for this. When we try to find the one model, we search for the model that's going to suck the least. We look for the one that has the least painful trade-offs between the two. That's a complicated problem. When we build out separate models and specialize them, we look for the model that's going to be optimal in each case. And very often building two optimal models is going to be far simpler and cheaper than trying to build that model that sucks the least. So with that, I will go to questions, but I'm not sure on their timings if we actually have time. We do have time. I am really, I'm really confused now. <laughs> Dear God, I, I hope I don't have to take a train now. <laughs> So if changes happen that they have not seen, they can get back a concurrency exception from that. Now, today I went through a... Oh, you need to get the microphone over. Uh, you talk about like separate system for reading your writing. Uh, do you need some special setup for your data, data storage? Because uh, you can set up for... Uh, in one way for reading and another way for writing or use like same or do you have some synchronization or something like that? Well the synchronization that happens between the two is the events. Since we're storing all of the events and we know that I can deal with any possible projection off of my event stream, what we would say is well that read model is just another set of projections. So we can guarantee any possible projection can be done off of our event stream. So we just let it do any possible projection that it wants to do. Normally, it's also going to be stored in a denormalized form. It's important to remember as well that that first normal form database is not necessarily a first normal form database. One of the questions I love asking clients as I go around is, what data on this screen changes depending who the user is? And very often, they say that there isn't any data. In which case, XML with HTML being transformed off of it works really, really well in a lot of those cases. We can also use document databases, all sorts of things. But it's basically the event handlers that are synchronizing off of the right side model. For my event storage, I've used everything from files to HBase to in-memory. That one's always fun. <laughs> the thing is, it's really easy to create one. Um, a lot of them you can use databases. And one of the nice things about using a database is you don't have to rewrite all the transactional logic associated with it, especially if you want to support a two-PC write or a two-phase commit write, a uh, distributed transaction with something else. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just writes. Yeah. 
define as the ideas for the violence of your as uh, probably parts of it. If I can just repeat the question, uh, what would I define as criteria for applying it? Um, well, there's different levels of applying it. Um, a lot of people get value with their current domain models just separating out uh, reads from writes and going back to the same database. If we start talking about using event sourcing, a lot of this other stuff, uh, there's a couple things that really come into play. Uh, whether or not we have people collaborating on data is a big one. But it's not the only one. There's other reasons why I may want to do it without actually having people collaborating on the same data. Um, some examples of this might be if I were building out uh, occasionally connected systems and I needed to have very strong logging capabilities. Um, some other examples might be something like a training system where there is no collaboration on data, but you've got very unusual non-functional requirements coming down. Um, like I said before, not very many people need to process 10,000 transactions per second. Using an event is much faster than we're using a database, as an example. There's lots of these little things that can come into play. But when we start talking about with domain-driven design, places where I want to use domain-driven design, which is normally decided within a bounded context, it's not decided as a system as a whole, then the overlap where I would want to use it becomes probably 95% or higher. The only place where I would not consider it where I was using domain-driven design is if it was a domain answering what-if questions, simulation type stuff. It's not clear for me how, for example, we can get uh, last uh, what, uh, last items which were ordered by all the users. I mean, it's easy to query by a specific user, so we get some rows and generate this object. But for example, if uh, our customer wants to get some statistics like which... Uh, they would do that from the read model. The read model can very easily build out of you to do that. It's actually not that big of a problem. Um, I, I hate to pawn off the, the question, but there's about a 30 to 45 minute discussion about that on the video, and for me to answer it right now is probably not uh, the best use of time. But basically what you end up with is versioning, and inside of the video it actually shows you how that versioning actually works in code. It's not that difficult so long as you follow a few simple rules. Thank you.